Section 12 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Lecture 5 The Work of Iron in Nature, Art, and Policy. Part 2 Iron in Art passing then from the offices of the metal and the operations of nature to its uses in the hands of man you must remember in the outset that the type which has been thus given you by the lifeless metal of the action of body and soul together has noble antitype in the operation of all human power all art worthy of the name is the energy neither of the human body alone nor of the human soul alone but of both united one guiding the other good craftsmanship and work of the fingers joined with good emotion and work of the heart there is no good art nor possible judgment of art when these two are not united yet we are constantly trying to separate them our amateurs cannot be persuaded but that they may produce some kind of art by their fancy or sensibility without going through the necessary manual toil that is entirely hopeless without a certain number and that a very great number of steady acts of hand a practice as careful and constant as would be necessary to learn any other manual business no drawing is possible on the other side the workman and those who employ him are continually trying to produce art by trick or habit of fingers without using their fancy or sensibility that also is hopeless without mingling of heart passion with hand power no art is possible no fine art that is the highest art unites both in their intensest degrees the action of the hand at its finest with that of the heart at its fullest hence it follows that the utmost power of art can only be given in a material capable of receiving and retaining the influence of the subtlest touch of the human hand that hand is the most perfect agent of material power existing in the universe and its full subtlety can only be shown when the material it works on or with is entirely yielding the chords of a perfect instrument will receive it but not of an imperfect one the softly bending point of the hair pencil and the soft melting of color will receive it but not even the chalk or pen point still less the steel point chisel or marble the hand of a sculptor may indeed be as subtle as that of a painter but all its subtlety is not bestowable nor expressible the touch of titian correggio or turner is a far more marvellous piece of nervous action than can be shown in anything but color or in the very highest conditions of executive expression in music in proportion as the material worked upon is less delicate the execution necessarily becomes lower and the art with it this is one main principle of all work another is that whatever the material you choose to work with your art is base if it does not bring out the distinctive qualities of that material the reason of this second law is that if you don't want the qualities of the substance you use you ought to use some other substance it can be only affectation and desire to display your skill that lead you to employ a refractory substance and therefore your art will all be base glass for instance is eminently in its nature transparent if you don't want transparency let the glass alone do not try to make a window look like an opaque picture but take an opaque ground to begin with again marble is eminently a solid massive substance unless you want mass and solidity don't work in marble if you wish for lightness take wood if for freedom take stucco if for ductility take glass don't try to carve leathers or trees or nets or foam out of marble carve white limbs and broad breasts only out of that so again iron is eminently a ductile and tenacious substance tenacious above all things ductile more than most when you want tenacity therefore and involved form take iron it is eminently made for that it is the material given to the sculptor as the companion of marble with a message as plain as it can well be spoken from the lips of the earth mother here's for you to cut and here's for you to hammer shape this and twist that what is solid and simple carve out what is thin and entangled beat out i give you all kinds of forms to be delighted in 
fluttering leaves as well as fair bodies twisted branches as well as open brows the leaf and the branch you may beat and drag into their imagery the body and brow you shall reverently touch into their imagery and if you choose rightly and work rightly what you do shall be safe afterwards your slender leaves shall not break off in my tenacious iron though they may be rusted a little with an iron autumn your broad surfaces shall not be unsmoothed in my pure crystalline marble no decay shall touch them but if you carve in the marble what will break with a touch or mould in the metal what a stain of rust or verdigris will spoil it is your fault not mine these are the main principles in this matter which like nearly all other right principles in art we moderns delight in contradicting as directly and specially as may be we continually look for and praise in our exhibitions the sculpture of veils and lace and thin leaves and all kinds of impossible things pushed as far as possible in the fragile stone for the sake of showing the sculptor's dexterity footnote i do not mean to attach any degree of blame to the effort to represent leafage in marble for certain expressive purposes the later works of mr monroe have depended for some of their most tender thoughts on a delicate and skilful use of such accessories and in general leaf sculpture is good and admirable if it renders as in gothic work the grace and lightness of the leaf by the arrangement of light and shadow supporting the masses well by strength of stone below but all carving is base which proposes to itself slightness as an aim and tries to imitate the absolute thinness of thin or slight things as much modern wood carving does i saw in italy a year or two ago a marble sculpture of birds nests End footnote. on the other hand we cast our iron into bars brittle though an inch thick sharpen them at the ends and consider fences and other work made of such materials decorative i do not believe it would be easy to calculate the amount of mischief done to our taste in england by that fence ironwork of ours alone if it were asked of us by a single characteristic to distinguish the dwellings of a country into two broad sections and to set on one side the places where people were for the most part simple happy benevolent and honest and on the other side the places where at least a great number of the people were sophisticated unkind uncomfortable and unprincipled there is i think one feature that you could fix upon as a positive test the uncomfortable and unprincipled parts of a country would be the parts where people lived among iron railings and the comfortable and principled parts where they had none a broad generalization you will say perhaps a little too broad yet in all sobriety it will come truer than you think consider every other kind of fence or defense and you will find some virtue in it but in the iron railing none there is first your castle rampart of stone somewhat too grand to be considered here among our types of fencing next your garden or park wall of brick which has indeed often an unkind look on the outside but there is more modesty in it than unkindness it generally means not that the builder of it wants to shut you out from the view of his garden but from the view of himself it is a frank statement that as he needs a certain portion of time to himself so he needs a certain portion of ground to himself and must not be stared at when he digs there in his shirt-sleeves or plays at leapfrog with his boys from school or talks over old times with his wife walking up and down in the evening sunshine besides the brick wall has good practical services in it and shelters you from the east wind and ripens your peaches and nectarines and glows in autumn like a sunny bank and moreover your brick wall if you build it properly so that it shall stand long enough is a beautiful thing when it is old and has assumed its grave purple red touched with mossy green next to your lordly wall and dignity of enclosure comes your close-set wooden paling which is more objectionable because it commonly means enclosure on a larger scale than people want still it is significative of pleasant parks and well-kept field walks and herds of deer and other such aristocratic pastoralisms which have here and there their proper place in a country and may be passed without any discredit next to your paling comes your low stone dyke your mountain fence indicative at a glance either of wild hill country or of beds of stone beneath the soil 
the hedge of the mountains delightful in all its associations and yet more in the varied and craggy forms of the loose stones it is built of and next to the low stone wall your lowland hedge either in trim line or massive green suggested of the pleasances of old elizabethan houses the smooth alleys for aged feet and quaint labyrinths for young ones or else in fair entanglement of eglantine and virgin's bower tossing its scented luxuriance along our country waysides how many such you have here among your pretty hills fruitful with black clusters of the bramble for boys in autumn and crimson hawthorn berries for birds in winter and then last and most difficult to class among fences comes your handrail expressive of all sorts of things sometimes having a knowing and vicious look which it learns at race-courses sometimes an innocent and tender look which it learns at rustic bridges over cressy brooks and sometimes a prudent and protective look which it learns on passes of the alps where it has posts of granite and bars of pine and guards the brows of cliffs and the banks of torrents so that in all these kinds of defence there is some good pleasant or noble meaning but what meaning has the iron railing either observe that you are living in the midst of such bad characters that you must keep them out by main force of bar or that you are yourself of a character requiring to be kept inside in the same manner your iron railing always means thieves about or bedlam inside it can mean nothing else than that if the people outside were good for anything a hint in the way of fence would be enough for them but because they are violent and at enmity with you you are forced to put the close bars and the spikes at the top last summer i was lodging for a little while in a cottage in the country and in front of my low window there were first some beds of daisies then a row of gooseberry and currant bushes and then a low wall about three feet above the ground covered with stone crests outside a cornfield with its green ears glistening in the sun and a field path through it just past the garden gate from my window i could see every peasant of the village who passed that way with basket on arm for market or spade on shoulder for field when i was inclined for society i could lean over my wall and talk to anybody when i was inclined for science i could botanize all along the top of my wall there were four species of stonecress alone growing on it and when i was inclined for exercise i could jump over my wall backwards and forwards that's the sort of fence to have in a christian country not a thing which you can't walk inside of without making yourself look like a wild beast nor look at out of your window in the morning without expecting to see somebody impaled upon it in the night and yet farther observe that the iron railing is a useless fence it can shelter nothing and support nothing you can't nail your peaches to it nor protect your flowers with it nor make anything whatever out of its costly tyranny and besides being useless it is an insolent fence it says plainly to everybody who passes you may be an honest person but also you may be a thief honest or not you shall not get in here for i am a respectable person and much above you you shall only see what a grand place i have got to keep you out of look here and depart in humiliation this however being in the present state of civilization a frequent manner of discourse and there being unfortunately many districts where the iron railing is unavoidable it yet remains a question whether you need absolutely make it ugly no less than significative of evil you must have railings round your squares in london and at the sides of your areas but need you therefore have railings so ugly that the constant sight of them is enough to neutralize the effect of all the schools of art in the kingdom you need not far from such necessity it is even in your power to turn all your police force of iron bars actually into drawing-masters and natural historians not of course without some trouble and some expense you can do nothing much worth doing in this world without trouble and you can get nothing much worth having without expense the main question is only what is worth doing and having consider therefore if this be not here is your iron railing as yet an uneducated monster a sombre seneschal incapable of any words except its perpetual keep out and away with you would it not be worth some trouble and cost to turn this ungainly ruffian porter into a well-educated servant 
who while he was severe as ever in forbidding entrance to evilly disposed people should yet have a kind word for well-disposed people and a pleasant look and a little useful information at his command in case he should be asked a question by the passers-by we have not time to-night to look at many examples of ironwork and those i happen to have by me are not the best ironwork is not one of my special subjects of study so that i only have memoranda of bits that happened to come into picturesque subjects which i was drawing for other reasons besides external ironwork is more difficult to find good than any other sort of ancient art for when it gets rusty and broken people are sure if they can afford it to send it to the old iron shop and get a fine new grating instead and in the great cities of italy the old iron is thus nearly all gone the best bits i remember in the open air were at brescia fantastic sprays of laurel-like foliage rising over the garden gates and there are a few fine fragments at verona and some good trellis work enclosing the scala tombs but on the whole the most interesting pieces though by no means the purest in style are to be found in out-of-the-way provincial towns where people do not care or are unable to make polite alterations the little town of bellinzona for instance on the south of the alps and that of sion on the north have both of them complete schools of ironwork in their balconies and vineyard gates that of bellinzona is the best though not very old i supposed most of it of the seventeenth century still it is very quaint and beautiful here for example are two balconies from two different houses one has been a cardinal's and the hat is the principal ornament of the balcony its tassels being wrought with delightful delicacy and freedom and catching the eyes clearly even among the mass of rich wreathed leaves these tassels and strings are precisely the kind of subject fit for ironwork noble in ironwork they would have been entirely ignoble in marble on the grounds above stated the real plant of oleander standing in the window enriches the whole group of lines very happily the other balcony from a very ordinary looking house in the same street is much more interesting in its details it is shown in the plate as it appeared last summer with convolvulus twined about the bars the arrow-shaped living leaves mingled among the leaves of iron but you may see in the centre of these real leaves a cluster of lighter ones which are those of the ironwork itself this cluster is worth giving a little larger to show its treatment it is composed of a large tulip in the centre then two turk's cap lilies then two pinks a little conventionalized then two narcissi then two nondescripts or at least flowers i do not know and then two dark buds and a few leaves i say dark buds for all these flowers have been coloured in their original state the plan of the group is exceedingly simple it is all enclosed in a pointed arch the larger mass of the tulip forming the apex a six-foiled star on each side then a jagged star then a five-foiled star then an unjagged star or rose finally a small bud so as to establish relation and cadence through the whole group the profile is very free and fine and the upper bar of the balcony exceedingly beautiful in effect none the less so on account of the marvellously simple means employed a thin strip of iron is bent over a square rod out of the edge of this strip are cut a series of triangular openings widest at top leaving projecting teeth of iron then each of these projecting pieces gets a little sharp tap with a hammer in front which breaks its end inwards tearing it a little open at the same time and the thing is done the common forms of swiss ironwork are less naturalistic than these italian balconies depending more on beautiful arrangements of various curve nevertheless there has been a rich naturalist school at fribourg where a few bell handles are still left consisting of rods branched into laurel and other leafage in geneva modern improvements have left nothing but at annecy a little good work remains the balcony of its old hotel de ville especially with a trout of the lake presumably the town arms forming its central ornament i might expatiate all night if you would sit and hear me on the treatment of such required subject or introduction of pleasant caprice by the old workmen but we have no more time to spare and i must quit this part of our subject 
the rather as i could not explain to you the intrinsic merit of such ironwork without going fully into the theory of curvilinear design only let me leave you with this one distinct assertion that the quaint beauty and character of many natural objects such as intricate branches grass foliage especially thorny branches and prickly foliage as well as that of many animals plumed spined or bristled is sculpturally expressible in iron only and in iron would be majestic and impressive in the highest degree and that every piece of metal work you use might be rightly treated not only a superb decoration but a most valuable abstract of portions of natural form holding in dignity precisely the same relation to the painted representation of plants that a statue does to the painted form of man it is difficult to give you an idea of the grace and interest which the simplest objects possess when their forms are thus abstracted from among the surrounding of rich circumstance which in nature disturbs the feebleness of our attention in plate two a few blades of common green grass and a wild leaf or two just as they were thrown by nature are thus abstracted from the associated redundance of the forms about them and shown on a dark ground every cluster of herbage would furnish fifty such groups and every such group would work into iron fitting it of course rightly to its service with perfect ease and endless grandeur of result that is the end of section twelve